need a tweet. We should have had a tweet before this, probably. Yeah, that would have been a good idea. (laughs) Uh, You introduce us. uh, I'm going to tweet us. Um, Okay, cool. Darko, you do that. So, hello and welcome, everybody, to this week's uh, episode, show, session, whatever you want to call it, of Dev Beard Ops. Dev Uh, Beard Ops. No, it's not Beard Ops. Um, (laughs) And uh, just to... You made me look now. I'm Thank sorry. you. I'm I was, sorry. You, you made me check my my the graphic here to make sure I didn't have a typo. Thank you, Chris. Boy, it's the the beard on the inside that counts. Um, and we are continuing our discussion from last week, where we were talking about different deployment strategies. Um, and for those that um, of you that were here, we started off with the uh, very um, how shall we put it. Uh, Awesome one that a lot of people start off with known as the YOLO deployment, where you just log into the production server somehow and throw some code at it in some form or fashion and hope it doesn't work. And uh, today we're going to continue our discussion a little bit further down the line where we talk about canary deployments um, and how to do things in a you know slightly safer and better way. And uh, joining us today is uh, uh, Chris, uh, who is also on our team. Uh, so Chris, why don't you do a quick intro about yourself? Oh, hey, everybody. My name's Chris. Um, I... Uh, Most of my tech career has been in Australia for the last 20 years, but six months ago, I thought it was a great idea to move to Munich, Germany in the middle of the pandemic and uh, go from the solutions architecture team at AWS to the DevRel team working with with these knuckleheads. So I'm really excited to be here. (laughs) Haven't left my house in, you know, days at a time, but what are you going to do? And my my server's name is, I call my server knucklehead, but okay. (laughs) I listened to a little bit of last. I watched a little bit of last week's show. I couldn't watch the whole or the last episode, um, but yeah, I was sharing in the chat because I have some plenty of horror stories from my years. Uh, yeah, and that's one of the things we want to hear today. Um, so yes. over the last couple of weeks, we actually talked about you know your software testing, your deployment strategies, how things oh go God. good, how things go bad. And both Scopus and I shared some experiences we had in the past. So um, uh, we would like to hear that from you today as well. Um, uh, yeah. Before we do that, I just have to quickly interject and say welcome to everybody. And uh, also, let us know if the sound is good, all the usual stuff. And uh, let us yeah. know how you're doing. And uh, if you've got any stories to share as we go through this uh, absolute pleasant journey that will not um, you know, incur any kind of stress on people who have had to deal with us before, um, please tell us things you've done. So... Over to you, Chris. Oh, what do you, I mean, where where do I start? Where, I, I started my career. Look, I I, I was my, I have not been a professional developer pushing code to prod for a very long time. The last time I did, it was PHP. I will hear no bad words about PHP. And actually, mm. that company had a relatively decent deployment process. For we're talking the dark ages here. This was a long time ago. Yep. So you know, we had documented processes. We rotated who was the sort of release cop each time. Look, we weren't doing continuous deployment, of course not. What do you? Um, and, you know, we would basically, we, we, we used sim links to sort of change which version of the code we were pointing to. We had documented rollback procedures. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad, you know, um, it wasn't agile uh, or continuous by any stretch of imagination, but it worked pretty well. Um, all the way up to, you know, the most recent, you know, software company I worked for where we were deploying software, uh, a startup back in Australia, you know, they were doing, and this was only three or four years ago, they were still only doing releases every two weeks. They were timing them uh, for when their traffic was the lowest, which was uh, middle of the day Australia, which was middle of the night America. Um, The, you know, look, a startup. What I had joined as they were sort of really getting big. And early days, apparently, before I joined, you know, on on deployment Fridays, it would be Everybody stop work for half an hour and hit the site and just click around, click around on the staging site and see if you can break anything. And I was like, okay, well, one of the things I think, because one of the things I think I can do to help, let's make this a little bit more, uh, more professional, is I hired a couple QA guys, you know, because we, we, we didn't have any formal tests. You know, developers were building features, but not actually documenting that for, for everyone on what, how to actually test them properly. Um, so I hired a couple QA guys who got to work straightening that out. Um, and I actually asked them to time how long it took to test everything, because that was another thing we'd never done. We never actually tested how long it took to run through our full suite of tests. It took over eight hours. 
these guys were going home and doing it in their spare time. And I was like, okay, this is not, we, we have to push for automation. Right. Like at the time, look, the, the thought was we can throw people at it, especially people in, we had an office in the Philippines. We had plenty of people there. Let's just throw them at it. And I was like, you know what? No, right. because we've hit the, we've hit the limit of scaling here and we have to actually move to automation. Um, so everything I was sort of doing with them was meant to be shortening that time. And I, our charity major has been tweeting and blogging a lot about this over at Honeycomb lately about really the job of a CTO or the job of any tech leaders to try and shorten that time between writing mm -hmm. code and getting it into production. So the last time I was involved in production releases, that was pretty much my focus was trying to make that happen. <laughs> we didn't get it down to CICD yeah. while it was there, but we've, um, I believe they have since I've gone, they've really shortened that window quite a lot. But, but tell me, Chris, so I, 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 I hear a new term here, release cop. Yeah. What does that mean? I, Do you not I, use release cop? I, it was, not, okay. I don't know if it was specific to that company. I thought it was used in the industry, at least in Australia, but basically it was whoever's turn it was to be okay. the release person. Um, oh, is that the person making the symlinks or is that person yes. just making sure? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So they okay. owned, they owned the release. So we spread it around. Actually, even the, the startup, I was just talking about the most recent example. They had that as well. We had a rotation. Um, the most coveted part of that was whoever was doing it got to name the release Ooh, and we had, a, and we did alphabetically and we had themes. So for example, we did mm. cheeses. So you'd have the cheddar <laughs> release and then the like, yeah, exactly. Um, and then we went on to like monsters, you know, like the good Go Gojira release and stuff like we had. Yeah. That was the most coveted part of being the release cop was you got to, that was your only perk was you but, got but, to do that. But, but I would imagine now in the, in the modern world, uh, the term release cop would be. Oh, exactly. No uh, one does that. Uh, exactly. Are you, well. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, if you're releasing once a month. Yeah. Um, and there are still it, people who have to do that for, for various yeah. reasons. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Uh, I mean, so the reason I brought this up is we use these um, as an, each one had a little avatar like this, and whoever had it on the top of the screen was the release person or ah. the person on call or something. So you could visually, just because it was open plan office, you could see, oh, that's the person I need to go to if there's an issue. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We, yeah. we just documented it all in the wiki. We had, I mean, one of the other things we did is we do the release and there was no announcement, like there were no release notes that anyone else in the company could see what was in the release. There oh, was wow. the... GitHub commit log, which I had access to, but none of the non-technical people did. So I started writing up with the release cops help. Let me actually write up for everyone else in the business what the hell we actually released. Um, and that became sort of a tradition that I believe they've carried on since because how mm. were people supposed to know? How were the marketing team supposed to know what yeah. to tell people about? <laughs> well, the and look, we were releasing out. stuff. I should mention, we were releasing stuff under feature flags and things like that. So it wasn't, no. it, it, we were getting there. We were yeah. getting there. Mm. We were doing some right stuff. Okay. Okay. Mm. That's a good point. You know, uh, we haven't, have we talked about feature flags uh, last time, Kobus? We have No, not. we didn't really. It's a good time to talk about the day. Yeah. But I just quickly want to ask uh, if uh, everybody is happily listening and hearing us because I am concerned that I'm not seeing any comments flowing in. So if yeah. a person can literally send a letter, yes, can somebody send just a letter through so we know that? Things aren't broken because we don't have monitoring for the stream, unfortunately. Yeah, we see folks on stream on stream, but we do see no actions. Um, oh, hello, someone hello. left there. You there go. We oh, thank go. you, Father awesome. Goblin. Okay, <laughs> okay they're cool. just hanging on my every word, so it's fine. Yeah, and the question from the audience: uh, uh, Do you or have you ever been uh, a release cop? Uh, at least in the in the terms that Kobus I was Kobus and Chris explains. I was a release cop. Yeah, no. Oh, you mean? Asking them. Mm -hmm. Asking them. Yeah. Like, yeah. I want to see if, if people in the audience but, were release cops and was it fun? So I, I or did you dread it? Uh, it sometimes was fun. It means that you were, in our context, at least responsible for making sure things are working and also like traffic directing issues to different people. So the fact that you didn't have yeah. to worry about your stuff was actually quite good because um, we tended to do quite a lot of pair programming. So if I was release cop and it's something I'd worked on was broken, I would quickly just chat to whoever was pairing up with me on that feature and say, listen, this is broken. Please go look at it and then go back to checking everything else. But um, uh, release so the, the scapegoat, month... <laughs> Father Goblin. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly but that. that. Means, so if, if you are a release cop or scapegoat, you have to fix the problem if it goes bad, right? Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> no, Well, you okay. own it. <laughs> Not you have to find the person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have to make okay. sure it gets fixed. Um, 
So you spoke about every month releases, uh, Chris, and I used to work, and this many years ago, on a project that was hosted on uh, SVN, where it was uh, released every six months, except there were probably, I don't know how many teams. I do know that we had 54 different branches of things being worked on. And then there were merged teams. So literally the only job was merging code between all the branches day in and day out, nothing else, and then kicking it back to the teams when the merging didn't make sense. And then, um, as you can imagine, release day was uh, quite an interesting scenario, deploying to hundreds of servers. Yeah, um, yeah. so it's... I can't can imagine that being your only job, to merge other people's code. That was like oh, teams full like of people. Punishment. Yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> But how would this look like if you have this spaghetti mess of different branches uh, yeah. and you have different people working mm. in different branches, how many merge conflicts do you have to work with here? <laughs> well, so they were fairly good at organizing people working in different segments. But when it got to the database portion, that used to be quite yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. just want to reference a couple of things here in the chat. Um, Varad mentioned that my voice is a bit low. Uh, I've increased it right now, so maybe it's better. I always struggle with that, apparently. Uh, hey, from Tunisia, and hey, from Serbia. Hey, no, hey, Krle, hi, from Rostov. Hey. Um, welcome to the stream. Uh, this stream is about deployment strategies, and we have Chris here to talk us, talk to us about it, and talk to her about us about her experiences with fun deployments, in quotes. Uh, so um, yeah, so far so far we heard uh, things. Uh, at least I heard something new um, called um, uh, what is it called? Uh, release uh, cop. Release cop. <laughs> I have never. And yes, you well, get an outfit. Uh, you yeah. get an outfit. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. As long as you get a uniform, I'm fine and a hat. Um, I used to be what you call a release cop, but I didn't call it that way. I was hey, release this software. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that was what it's called in my company. But um, uh, but yeah, that's very cool. Uh, so two things I want to also mention before we move on to talking about. Um, uh, talking flags. about canary deployments, I want to talk about feature flags, yeah. mm -hmm. and I also want to talk about um, QA because QA is something we all think. Oh, QA! We all know what QA is, but not a lot. A lot of us know how QA works. So um, I would like to hear all of that as well. So feature flags. What are feature flags? Um, I'll give my explanation of it, but uh, please feel free, feel, feel free to correct me. We'll feature flag flags. <laughs> so you deploy a feature to a product or service or something, but it is not enabled. Basically, you you deploy it as a part of your code base. It's there, but it is just not yet available to everybody. The way you make it available to everybody is just by enabling a feature flag saying, hey, feature X or the version of feature X is now available for use. Hence, the rollbacks are easier <laughs> let's, let's call it that way unless you have a breaking feature flag but you should not ever have a breaking feature flag so um you cannot apply feature flags to all things some things can work with feature flags it's very difficult to make a rehaul of everything and do it under a feature flag uh but um specific services specific features or versions of the features you launch can be done under feature flags was that correct that's i agree with all of that yeah Yay. i mean we we didn't do it as an all or nothing, turn it on for everyone or not. So okay. we actually sort of used it, you know, I, I, we're going to talk about, I guess, canary deployments. But we, um, so this was a, a, a product that was used, a web app that was used by people. And so actually whenever anyone signed up, we sort of randomly assigned them to one of a thousand cohorts. And then we had the ability to turn on a feature for a given cohort. Mm. So we could test it with a one thousandth of our traffic okay. and see okay. if, if bugs started increasing, see if... Uh, we also had the ability, I think we also had a special cohort just for the staff so that we could turn it on just for just for the employees yeah. as well so that we could try stuff out. So that was that was nice. Yeah. And this, this is kind of just a, a thing where people can, um, you, you don't rely on tools behind the scenes, you actually rely on your software, on your application to, to police okay. itself to say who, do, who does the traffic go to or who, who does the, who gets the feature flag or not, right? So mm. well, you, you can rely right. on external factors, of course, right? You can yeah, store yeah. your mm. flags elsewhere, but is it's your application that makes the logic. It's not the infrastructure that makes the logic in most mm. use cases. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Mm. Um, cool, cool. Um, Kovas, did you work with feature flags in your past? Um, we had some, not many. Um, it was kind of like with 
and yeah, that gives away my age. The time when I was working on the stuff, there wasn't really a thing known as feature flags. Okay. Um, <laughs> there was the thought process wasn't there. Neither was Git. Uh, neither was any of the cloud providers. Um, so initially, no. Um, later on, we did it a little bit, but it often what happened is like I, I did a whole long stint between um, lots of different startups, and when your team is that small, uh, it almost didn't make sense uh, for us to go to because there's more work to actually get them going. Uh, and there is a payoff, but for us, the, mm. the type of things we were building, didn't, it didn't quite make as much sense. Um, we'd rather have a mechanism where we could send some um, production uh, calls through the system with a new code to test. Does it kind of behave the way we do expect it to by looking at the database results and things? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's actually a question <laughs> on, on Twitch chat um, um, from Mancus. He says, um, how do you convince developers to get on board with feature flags? So tell me. What are the great things about feature flags? Um, unless we have already answered this question. Mm. Well, for well, the us, big thing is oh, we, you we go first. You've got a chance. Uh, I was going to say, like you, Kobus, it didn't. They didn't have them when it was a very small team building the initial MVP of the product. It was only as we started to get multiple teams working on different feature sets of trying to avoid the pro the huge merge conflicts of being able to merge more frequently and know that it's fine, the code can be inc included in the release, it's just not turned on for people. So that we, we implemented it when we got to that point and I, I think it's it solved some of the merge hell problems once teams got bigger. Mm. Yeah, good point. Ultimately, it's to make your life easier, right? It's that if you make a deploy and it is bad, it's relatively easy to roll back rather than changing mm. the code base altogether because you have the feature, you have the code, even if it's bad inside of your code base. But uh, as as if you make it around the feature flag, you can just disable it and it, and it should not affect mm. um, the thing you're doing unless you're making a big <laughs> underlying change of the things. So, that, oh, yeah. And being able to roll out to just a subset is very handy. Yeah, because yeah, the, the big thing is like, uh, we mentioned last time as well as like there is only one production you can't test certain things outside of production specifically at scale um and this is one of the few ways you can actually do that is send some traffic to it see how it behaves if you uh, if the concern yeah. obviously is metrics and behavior and because you can test and calculate up to a certain point how you're going to perform but what are, are the side effects of the rest of the system if your calls a little bit slower what are the knock-on effects yeah yeah good point good point um it's not it's it's very difficult to test your code at scale before you deploy it to production, no matter how great you have your QA, uh, sorry, your your staging environment set up, you know your your pre prod stuff, um, it is still very difficult due to the um, not just the scale, but also due to the fact how your customers use it. Because mm. um, your team that tests this might not use it in the same way or use the same patterns as your customers do, which brings us to the team that tests it, yes. the QA, the quality assurance. Which I always confuse with Q and A. It's like a Q A Q and A. What? Is it? So um, <laughs> they both ask a lot of questions. <laughs> they both ask a lot of questions. So quality assurance team is the team that actually, well, assures your quality, makes sure that your application is the way the way it works. But um, mm. I have actually in my previous career, I've never worked with a QA team, so I don't really know how the interaction interaction works. So I would like to hear your experiences. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I've worked with heaps. Um, like it's very common in the companies I worked with to have uh, at least one QA person on the sort of cross-functional team. You know, um, uh, I worked for one of the media companies, like a free-to-air TV channel in in Australia, and we did the the Catch a TV app um, for Android, iOS, and web. And so we had one guy who who you know for each release uh, would be testing. Um, then when at the startup I was talking about the web app. We had two people, one who focused on the mobile apps, one who focused just on the web because they were very different code bases. Um, and yeah, uh, because you do reach a point where, yes, the team clicking around, they tend to not test it in the way users would. Um, and also the, the other cool thing that the guys did was they started, for example, we had a customer support team who would get you know bug reports and whenever customers had problems. And every week they would send out an email with, here are the top complaints that customers have. And I asked the question, what, what's happening with those? Nothing. None of the engineers were bothering oh, to wow. look at them. Yeah. They had priorities. So I was like, great, QA guys, let's see if we can replay, re, you know, reproduce any of these and actually document them properly because you know, customer support people don't necessarily, weren't you know, giving us everything we'd need to reproduce or to document. So they worked on that. They set up, as I said, getting some metrics around how long our testing was taking, making sure that new features actually had 
uh, user tests because we would release yeah. something and we didn't actually have documented all the ways a user might break that. Um, so yeah, our, our QA guys were really, really important. Um, and I believe they've expanded that team since I left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, but do, do the QA people actually, you know, give feedback to the service teams or do they prevent, do they prevent codes from entering production? It, it, it depends a lot. So, um, what I've, what I've seen is traditionally usually expect the QA teams to give you feedback on a specific build saying, okay. listen, these are the things that are broken and as it's often a very large work doc word document. Um, and then you work through it and do that, but they're not the people making the decision whether or not it can go out. They just give the feedback mm -hmm. of what they mm -hmm. found that was broken or not behaving. Okay. Um, and then from there becomes a, a product owner manager discussion normally. Yeah. We we worked really hard to try it because it, at the start, you're right, QA was just at the final step. They were doing the mm. testing before we decided whether we were going to put that out or not. We worked really hard to try and embed them into the various feature teams so that they would actually be helping test stuff as it was being developed. You know, it's much easier to fix something the earlier, you know, the earlier in the process that sh yeah. shift left or, you know, <laughs> we were trying to get that happening. And so getting them sitting in the weekly prioritization, getting them just really embedded and working closely with the devs, as opposed to them being this other team that just got imposed as a final release check. That was really important to me. This, that's also like the problem, uh, the company I was work, work with, we had really separated teams. We had, uh, we didn't have a QA team, but we had developers, we had sysadmins and network admins and whatnot, literally sitting in different rooms, not talking to each other. So um, by having a QA team, part of your entire development, <laughs> QA, ML, ML, Cobus, you missed ML. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, having QA teams uh, be much closer to what you do is, is better mm -hmm. because they, they, I mean, upfront, they know what's happening. They know what is the, what is the, what is the thing that's being worked on and what should they look into? So oh, yeah. I, I, I think that brings, brings a lot of good mm -hmm. things here. And I agree with Stormy Prime mm -hmm. here. Cross-functional teams are purple heart. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, definitely. I mean, I've, I've had that way. The testers weren't involved in the actual product design and then they came back yeah. with, but shouldn't work like this. Or why didn't you build it like that? You kind of go like, thank you for your input. We already had the discussion. There's a whole day long discussion about why yeah. or why not, and then yeah, but 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 okay. So let, let's let's talk about the, the 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 human side of this. Um, developers or people building things can get defensive when you get somebody in just to judge what you did. Uh, so it is it is very important that you mm. treat those people as part of the team. You know, if you have yeah. a QA team, it's like, it's like the same story with security people. The security is the boogeyman. They're always here to try to break your things away because that's not according to their standards. So by by having the QA team within your team or having close association with them helps them be more friendly or helps them not be treated as like, oh, this is these are the persons who just come here and talk smack about what I yeah. do. So um, that also well, brings a great thing. And unless they log you forty eight bugs for full stop missing at end of well, report yeah. title be I because they terrible... incentivize per bug. Yeah. No, we didn't do that. But we had because our guys were remote, I actually flew them to Sydney for two weeks to sort of sit with the developers to build that trust to yeah. to mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's really important. You you cannot rely on it being completely remote. And the other thing I was going to highlight there is, look, one of the reasons we talk about the need to build diverse teams is because then you yes. get more eyeballs on it using your product in different ways. Yep. The truth of it is, even though we, we tried to increase the diversity on our team, the developers were not the audience that this product was designed for. And they were never <laughs> going to use it in the way that our customers were. Our customers were incredibly creative at breaking the thing in ways that we had not anticipated. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, that was the sort of thing that the Q, that a good QA person will specialize mm. in and, and give you that that sort of feedback. I mean, they can talk about pull out accessibility issues you haven't considered. That's a huge one. Um, correct, correct. Mm. Yeah. A lot of times people just don't notice that. And I think, mm. I think you know, this justifies a discussion, a whole entire discussion for itself about... Um, when you're creating something, when you're building something as a developer, as an engineer, as an architect, you build it with your eyes and with your perspectives. But when somebody starts using it or somebody actually starts looking at your code, it's like, hmm, are you sure this is the best way to do it? And of course, it might be the wrong thing, they say. Absolutely. But at least you got a second opinion. So I think always QA teams, 
um, your code buddies, that's where you get pair programming in, your rubber mm -hmm. duckies or whatever you have, it is it is the thing that helps you may mm -hmm. maybe not program for yourself or not build just for yourself and try to actually think of the of the other people that may be using your product. It's my rubber duck. <laughs> your rubber duck? Who is that? Uh, that's Peggy Olson from Mad Men. Peggy Olson. Wow, I didn't show. Yeah. I didn't know she had a Funko Pop. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Cool. Um, I talked to Peggy. <laughs> so Stormy Prime says, "My team has been referred to as the DevOps gods, who mm. make decision and they will have to mm. fall in line, which is really sad and is going to take work to undo that image." Definitely. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's mm. a that's a problem when you do things. If you position yourself as the overarching authority of doing things which you may be are, right? That's fine. You may be that, mm. you need to make that decision. That's part of your job. But that's why you need to be part of that team to help, you know, not just not just tell them, no, this is not good. This is what you should do. But be involved from the beginning because it it, 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 suit, it suits the, the no at the end because it makes it much more... Mm. You know, uh, if I come to, come, I come to you from, you know, from broad skies and tell you, hey, that sucks, you will be mad. But if I was keep if I was telling this to you that you should do it this way for the last two months and you do it the other way, you're not going to be as angry because you knew you you screwed up. So it's a very oh. old stereotype. I mean, Kobus, you're old like me. Do you do you remember the B O F H stereotype? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What does B O F H stand for? I mean, bastard operator, operator from, from hell. Ah, bastard operator from hell. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. The, okay. The the challenge with this, however, is that there's that fine line between because uh, I've been a lot of like you know DevOps team roles and all those kind of things. It's that line between finding the best path for the team to take and helping them versus them then starting to rely on you for things. Because you have to get the that mindset of we are enabling you, we are providing you with recommended ways of doing things. But yep. like you just mentioned, Darko, you're welcome to go off the path. And I use this in a couple of talks before. It's like there's the golden path, which is easy yep. and it's got a lot of things baked in, but you don't have to take it. If you do yep. want to go in another direction, that's all perfectly fine with one caveat. You're on your own. You're on your you own. You can't yeah. come running to other teams to come and help fix your mess if you decide you don't want to use the um, like the standardized yeah. ways of doing things. The same thing, uh, you know, having a two pizza team approach. You can do your application in whatever language you want, but mm. if you're using something esoteric, like, I don't know, I'm sorry, Scala. Crystal. It's Crystal. Pascal. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Scala is not esoteric. There are a lot of people using Scala. There's there's dozens of us. Um, and uh, <laughs> and if you decide to do something like that, you absolutely can. You you're able to mm. fit into the entire uh, uh, in the entire team or everything else you're doing. But just be careful that it may take you down the line, which you will cause more problems than than good things. So um, hence also working with your QA people, your security people, your mm -hmm. Uh, Dev DevOps gods, <laughs> however you call them, yeah. So um, or your BOFH as well. Just Team Team Gojira. That's team what Gojira. we call ourselves because we were going to stomp over all the infrastructure before we fixed it. There you go. <laughs> um, but let's actually uh, answer some questions here. Um, um, mm. Step back to to the feature flag talks. Um, um, warp speed sixty six. Feature flags you split your code into path in your split your code paths. What strategies do you recommend? that they are not long lived, e.g. a six month old feature flag when toggled can result in unexpected behaviors. That's the thing I, I, I never worked with feature flags, but it's a great thing um, about how do you handle old feature flags? Do you bake them in into the, like the, once you have toggled it and just keep it permanently toggled on? Or yeah, I think we hadn't solved that problem. We ended up okay. in that state where we had, a, the other thing, actually, you know, the other thing we used them for, which we didn't mention was A-B testing. A, B, we testing, would actually yeah. develop two different versions of something yeah. and test them with different cohorts. And then you'd have mm. to pick one to win and then go back and clean all that up. <laughs> and I remembered we were talking about, mm. yes, having to go back and do a big cleanup because we, we hadn't, we, we hadn't solved that problem. Yeah. I mean, you can have There's a easy way to do it. toggle. Yeah. You, you can clean up. That's, that's the yeah. difficult part. You can just remove, you know, the older parts of the code if they don't break things. Um, but also you can have it just permanently toggled, which is good for the for the time being. You can disable the, the, the logic that will toggle it. But you still have a code mess in your in your thing and you, you it starts growing mm. exponentially as you as you build on new features. So which is not the best thing in the world. So um, Yeah, but I mean that's 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 code. I mean it's that's a living yeah. thing. It, it, yeah. it grows it like grows warts and things that you have to go sort out, all of those things. I mean it's 
the same with like for example if you do database changes it's yeah. you can do it safely by doing it in small steps but at the end of the day there might still be old code that you need to rip out otherwise even though it's not being used otherwise yeah. it confuses yeah. people well theoretically it should be part of the life cycle of releasing your feature you know it's it's actually part of that it's not a once your features you know <clears throat> you've turned the feature flag on you're done yeah yeah so uh, Stormy Prime actually suggested uh, we read stuff posted by Launch Darkly on mm. Future Flags. Cool. So um, yeah, uh, launchdarkly.com. Um, that's from where you should go. From Hedy, whoa, I want to say Woodhouse. I can't remember his name now. I don't know. I'm going to paste uh, the link here. So um, cool. Yeah, mm. there we go. This, actually, this is the link, launchdarkly.com. Mm. <clears throat> that's their site. I, I, I'm sure that the stuff is somewhere there, but yeah. Um, Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. Another com uh, comment here from Varad Carpe. We are uh, we are all of these issues uh, that Chris's team faced. Uh, were all of these issues that Chris's team faced identified during a beta uh, testing of the program, or was there no such program for that? There was no such program for that. I mean, <laughs> 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 I, I joined a few years in, so the product had been like they'd had an MVP, they'd iterated on it. I mean, I think the original version of the product may have even been. Flash? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah. you, you know, it became a web app. They built on it. Um, and as I said, the solution to rolling out beta test was it was essentially to have, like I said, those thousand buckets that we group people in and we could turn things on for them. Yeah. Um, that was basically it. We didn't officially, and I think we, we, we sort of hacked a beta tester program by having a cohort that we could add people to specifically to turn on feature flags. So we sort of started identifying power users who would get early access and give us feedback to new features. Um, but yeah, that was, we, we were undergoing a massive, like you know, hit those inflection points as a startup where, you know, we started to get traction. We were getting massive daily users and our code base was getting to the point where it was like, okay, we need to actually now go back and refactor because it's getting, it's taking longer and longer to onboard new employees yeah. to be able to make a change to one part without affecting something else. Um, and that was, that was sort of the point where I was there. Yeah. Excellent point. A um, couple more things I want to uh, mention here. Uh, there's a question from Dan MBA. Oh, Dan, welcome back. We see you here quite a bunch. Um, how do you deal with feature flags for compiled versus interpreted languages? external feature flags um that's my my yes. thing but yes. yes 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 so the problem here come is if you come if you have an interpreted language like python or or you know javascript it can always just you can change the flag with a single commit it's perfectly fine there's no need to rebuild anything it's it's relatively easier to do that you mm. can change it when it comes to compiled languages you have to go through the entire build process all over again um which is you have to bake in a feature basically um, or you can use external configuration files, yeah. which can be I'm problematic. Um, I'm because... trying to remember what we did for the mobile apps. I think we only used the feature flags on the web. I don't think we had yeah. them on the mobile apps oh. for that reason, because they were native apps. Yeah. The, the problem comes in with, with compiled applications that you can have an external feature flag, but that causes a problem because um, the external feature flag needs to be always available. Mm. If something happens to the, the your ability to reach an external feature flag, yeah. Your your application can be problematic. <laughs> you, it cannot just not, not enable. A feature. Well, you, 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 you should have same things. defaults. You well, should you have same, same default. Yeah, for the feature flag has to have a default. I mean, if you forget to set it, any yeah. like level of that config has to have a fallback value that you know is safe-ish. Yeah, yeah. But you know, let's let's say I have a, I have my application that's compiled in Rust. Of course, it is. Uh, and I, I I made a new feature that my it will make my my website purple and it's depending on a feature flag now it might have a sensible default my application that my website is red but because i've enabled this feature flag it's purple so if my feature flag is no longer available if i'm using an external service or a store um, to reach that feature flag and it cannot reach that feature flag my website mm. will default to red which you know renders my feature useless because it's no longer being used so this is a problem you you need to try to uh, overcome with these and i'm sure there are great ways to do it um but um, uh, you know, <laughs> after a while, as, as as Chris says, you bake in those changes, you clean up your code, and make the feature flag a permanent part of your application and a, and a default. So that that could be one thing. Mm. No, the the other thing with uh, around the compiled language, I know um, in C sharp is very common. You have different build profiles, so you tend to yeah. have like default or debug slash development, and also then uh, production. Um, and there's another subtlety there. 
Um, interesting, sorry, my camera is slow today. I think it's because of the green screen mess behind me. Um, is that they had different build profile, literally with if else blocks inside the code to do different things and set values based on which one you compile. But there's another side effect to that, which is if you don't use the production um, compile profile, it actually compiles the, the the code in a way that you can actually easy de easily decompile it again okay. if you wanted to do and get like the object pointers and things. Well, not object pointers, was, I can't remember what it was called, but basically unobfuscated code, uh, which is also concerned. So in general, you want to have the exact same bold step for the code for that you test versus roll out production ultimately, which often brings you back to the whole container discussion. Right. Debug right. symbols. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Debug symbols. Yeah. But also this, this depends, um, you know, your feature flags can be, um, can be, and, and this is me just thinking out loud. You can, especially if using something like containers, right. And you're using compiled codes and containers, your feature flag can be somewhere outside of your code. It can be a feature flag. Mm. In, yep. indicating that production is currently using this image mm -hmm. and testing is using this image. It's just a feature flag that just kind of enables a different code set. Are we getting into different territories now? I'm not sure, but it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think mm. there were cases at the TV network where they would not let us do certain things. They were, there was so much worry that people could get access in some way to content or to a feature that wasn't intended. And especially yeah. when you're talking like old media, like TV, they had some very mm. strict like embargoes of we were not allowed to even get anything near prod related to certain certain things. Cause you know, mm. oh, someone will figure out the survivor winner by poking yeah, around. Yeah. There was that worry, even though we told them it couldn't happen. So some of that stuff we couldn't, we couldn't even put stuff on prod and we still had to do the deployment. Uh, to roll it out like that traditionally. Fair point. Good point. Mm. Um, okay, so let's kind of sl slowly uh, in. Yes, yeah, Stormy. Towards... See, that's a good one, Stormy. Like, do, do they have a, a company email address? Like, I could easily yeah. see someone figuring a way around that one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's slowly inch away towards the the deployments, right? We let's talk about mm. a bit more about deployments and feature flags and and things we talked about today kind of fit into the into the type of deployment we want to chat about today. And that is canary deployments. It is one type of deployments we haven't had a chance to talk uh, on, uh, on a lot about last week. But it is a deployment where in essence, you do very similar things to what we talked about, you deploy a new version of your code or a specific feature of your code to a subset of your audience. That subset can be controlled by just percentage of the traffic, or it can be controlled somehow manually. Um, the, 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 the thing with the canary deployments compared to just having your standard, let me deploy it to a part of things and, and, and see how it works, is that it is automated or should be automated. Mm. Uh, Kobus mentioned this last time, but the, can, the term canary deployment comes from the term where your miners used to go to dig mines and they would bring, bring a canary bird with them. And as long as the canary bird was alive and singing, everything was okay. Because, but, but because of the Sad. bird was small, yeah, because the bird is small, mm -hmm. it's highly susceptible to methane poisoning. And if you're mm -hmm. digging a coal mine and all of a sudden there's a methane leak and you don't notice it, the bird does. <laughs> the bird stops singing, to use a euphemism, uh, and just uh, croaks. And that means it's time to roll back the miners from the mine. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The same thing uh, functions for canary deployments. You deploy a piece of code and you keep monitoring it. You keep mm -hmm. looking out for that canary. Is it alive? Are any bells being triggered? Um, is there a methane leak? Is there any of those things? And if it happens, you roll back. But the difference between doing this and blue green is that you're actually deploying to production. You're deploying your code to a subset of your production users to roll back automatically. Mm. So this brings a good point. What do you measure? What is the methane here? Easy. CPU, memory, and disk, isn't that it? <laughs> yeah, metrics. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, the answer here is always it depends. Um, there is no clean answer here. Um, mm, one there is. Clean, there, yeah, there is one. You need baselines. Always... It's all dependent on your baselines, really. <laughs> but I, I would say always one of one of the big things you need to monitor, and it's a, it's a kind of a catch-all thing. Monitor for business outcomes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yes. it's I don't know what your business outcomes are, but you know if your business mm. outcome is to um, convert video streams consumed. Yeah. Yeah. Photos uploaded. Whatever. Yeah. new account openings and all of those things. So if you see those things going out of bounds 
or not being fulfilled, there might be a problem. <laughs> there might be a methane leak, and your canary mm. is letting us letting us know. So, um, <laughs> I mean, definitely go. Basically, the easiest way to do that is to go chat to your um, product owners. Tell them, hey, listen, what thing if you could pick like one or two? If you didn't see it, you'd be concerned that something's broken. And trust me, they'll give you things. They'll tell you like the examples we have now. Or for example, hey, we're not seeing any payments go through, or hey, we're not seeing orders or whatever. There, there will always be something somewhere. We actually did, you know, everybody talks about dashboards, but we had a dedicated sort of monitor in the main room that we all worked in, which had just those key and keys user business outcome metrics. But we made it animated. They made them cool. Like for every, you know, uh, every bit of user generated content, a little drop would come down different rainbow colors. And it got to where everyone would just look at it throughout the day yeah. and you would notice because we yeah. knew the trends. We knew that at this time of day, you'd expect to see that. And so the minute that something wasn't, mm. occasionally someone would have an asterisk. You'd see they'd actually go in and put an asterisk on it. Go, it's a public holiday in the States or something like yeah. that. And that's what we're seeing affect those numbers mm. because people got very used to looking at that. Oh, yeah. Mm. There's a lot of external factors that may change the thing you're monitoring. So, you know, yeah. if, if you're if you're launching on, on, on a holiday and all of a sudden, you your your business metrics are lower, and you're like, "What is happening?" You need to understand that the baseline for those days is much different than a baseline for something else. So you yeah. have to have that in mind. But to answer the question here from Varad Karpe, he says, "Rate of failure mainly is that what we're doing?" No, um, you should catch failure rates pretty early on. Uh, of course, there's production failure rates that are different. Of course, you should be monitoring that, but that's not the main thing. Um, because, you know, you need to monitor some, your, your business outcomes, your business metrics, your, um, actually performance metrics are important. Even though mm. we joke about CPU and, 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 um, and memory utilization, if you push something to production, a new piece of code, something vastly different, you may have changed the way things take. So if, uh, if a process of a payment took a second and a half, but all of a sudden it takes three seconds, something's wrong. Something is not the way you think. And you may not notice that there's a difference between a second and a three second in your testing because mm. it perfectly works. But it takes a bit longer. And, <laughs> and if you scale this up to your customer base, uh, you well, get I mean, to pay a lot more. A good example is this is that research they did with online um, shopping. It's I think it's something like, I want to say like half a second or 200 milliseconds. If you take longer mm. than that past a certain point, you immediately start losing like... Uh, a big chunk of people that are willing to buy on your site. You see, they click, pages are loading, okay, stuff this, let me go elsewhere. So it is that sensitive. Well, and failure rates aren't going to tell you if your new feature isn't being used because the button isn't visible on a specific <laughs> Android tablet. You know, it's not going to tell you anything like that that doesn't throw an error. Um, uh, Android yeah. tablets now I've got... PTSD, thank a thirty nine dollar Android tablet from Kmart. <laughs> oh, you know, and... oh, so I did Android. Did development that sound pain? In... Like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. In in twenty ten, and there was one device that we developed on that. So you've got the enums so with the different buttons being pressed, and one would assume that the enter button is enum dot enter. They, for some reason, in their device had it as other button, whatever that enum was in the code base. Yeah. 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 So we had to add if else blocks for that device. Thank you. <laughs> uh, an excellent point here by Stormy Prime. Again, average might not tell you much. Sometimes mm. you need to look at your percentiles because that's a very important thing. The outliers. If, if yeah, if you have, let's say, let's we're, let's say we're measuring latency for uh, for a certain API, and your latency is in you know constantly the let's say it's it's on one millisecond. All of a sudden, you receive a spike of three hundred milliseconds. Your average is no longer one millisecond. It is something much, much higher because it takes the big number it got mm. and it averages out. So you may look at it and say like, well, my API is bad. So averages in this case are not, you need to do, do the percentiles. Like what are what is the what is the average latency of your 99 percentile, right? Of the of the of the most of your calls. Um so 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 that is also very important when you do those things. Mm. I think it's important to visualize this because if you think of like a, a bell curve, it's um, is it is this a thin or a fat average? Because if it's a thin average, it means you've got this everybody in the same thing, but you've got very bad outliers over here. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's very widely spread, it means that sure your average is five milliseconds, but it means that f two or fifty or whatever the balance is out. It's you need to look at it more.
definitely. I'm trying to I'm trying to find out one of the decks I have is I have have a deck that that shows this really nicely about a specific API uh, that explains the um, um, the differences between uh, which percentiles you should look into. I'm just trying to see mm. if I can find it. Read I, I have it here. Okay, I found it. Uh -huh. It's yeah. from actually from Danilo's uh, Danilo's talk on uh, taking serverless to the next level. I'm just trying to find where is that slide. I want to share it with you. Uh, if it's I, a long deck, it sounds like. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge deck. Uh, yeah. uh, and clicking through all of it is not the best of things. Just uh, click through the P95 of it. <laughs> it there oh. is a find in PowerPoint, you know. It's not PowerPoint, it's speakerdeck.com. Oh. So. Oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, oh. Am trying to, I, I found it. Wait, wait, wait. I found it. Mm -hmm. Zoom in. Zoom in. Like that. Can I do that? Yes. Let's share. 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 Application window. Share. Boom. So this is the latencies and percentiles. Like this is an actual API graph of a specific API at AWS. And you can see mm. the differences here, right? You know, between a one second latency and and your mm. um, P100s, which is in this case a 24 uh, second latency. So this is the differences you need to, you need to be looking at. How, wow. how specific things look. So, yeah, mm -hmm. this kind of explains I mean, the, the, the vast differences they can be. So latency, some people might see, well, you know, there's not much difference between like, for example, a 10 millisecond and a, let's take 180 millisecond response time, because I mean, it's still faster than a human can actually realize it, except when you use it a lot. And the way I noticed this was way back um, when I used Terraform locally, um, as in from laptop to provision resources in Ireland because that's 180 milliseconds. And by the time you start doing hundreds of calls, that gets really slow. And then you run it on a server in the same region and it's like, wow, Terraform is actually a lot faster than I thought. So, so okay, if we're going to talk about latencies, and I guess this is also important to understand latencies. Um, um, mm. And I think there's a slide about that as well here. Let me just try to go back one thing. Yes, there is. Yes, I love this slide. <laughs> so. This is from a book by Brendan Gregg uh, about systems performance. Um, mm. And he explains how things look at scale, right? Your single CPU cycle is 0.3 nanoseconds. You know, that's just the thing you do. So uh, let, let's say if for that, uh, a simple transmit of a TCP packet would be one to three seconds. Or a uh, uh, um, um, timeout of SCSI would be 30 seconds. A reboot would be five minutes. Mm. But if you scale that up, by a factor of one second. So you go from 3, 0.3 nanoseconds to a one second for a CPU cycle. Your reboot is 32 millennia now. So all of that scales massively. This is important because if you're testing something locally and a single iteration of it, single Lambda function, single Terraform deployment to Ireland, once you start doing that at scale, especially at cloud scale, things can be very different. So uh, that is also very much important to understand that the, the the latencies, the 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 percentiles can change massively. On, uh, speaking as someone who lived in Australia, yes, it did take 19 <laughs> years to load a web page. Sometimes. <laughs> Is that to Australia or to Telstra? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> NBN, baby. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so mm. so yeah, these things are kind of very difficult. Um, to, to, you need to be aware of those things, especially if you're mm. going to grow. Um, and and this hits people, uh, especially if you, if you there's a term called the Reddit hug of death, where you or a Twitter hug of death, where you so, when you post something really viral on your website, and all of a sudden everybody oh, wants Darko. to see. Oh, Darko, that was called slash dotting back in the day. Slash dotting. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> oh, the kids I was nowadays, a, eh? I was a wee little kid when slash dot was a thing. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, basically, you know, all of a sudden you have exponential growth on, on your use case. Of course, in the cloud, it's easier to mitigate, but can your application handle that? Can your database handle that? H has, your, has your database been optimized for that? Um, is your code optimized? <laughs> I, I, I actually, so uh, I, I'm going to take a small tangent here. Speaking of optimized code, I was doing this... Um, a challenge the Euler, uh, the project Euler challenge about finding the mm. some prime numbers of things with things with Python. And in my logic, I had a bunch of loops and I did this thing and it took like 11 minutes to do all of that. <laughs> I changed one thing I've changed from a bunch of loops to just a mathematical function that will find me 
you know, prime numbers. I, I got it down to four seconds. It's, it's ridiculous mm-hmm. how a single thing can make such a change mm-hmm. um, at, 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 at the scale you want to do. So, <laughs> big O notation. It's a it's, yep. it's a good thing to know about. Yep. Yeah. Um, um, we've got a question here yeah. around um, just quickly. Uh, does AWS provide deployment strategies for static pages, HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript in a an S3 bucket? And the answer is yes. Definitely go take a look at AWS Amplifier. Actually, um, you point it at your repository, and then it'll pick up and actually guide you through it. It's a couple of clicks, and you should be able to have it up and running. Um, just for a static website, it's really quick. Yeah, and I've yeah. actually rolled my own for that sort of thing as well in the yeah. past um, using, I think I used Travis CI at the time because I wanted to try it out. Uh, and yeah. it was building some Jekyll pages and putting it into an S3 bucket. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. tutorials and various stuff to do that as well. Yeah, the, the easiest mm-hmm. way is definitely to just go ahead and and, 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 and um, use Amplify for yeah. your static web pages because it just, just works. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, j- just works. Caveat: Remember the fun we had on that show. <laughs> <Yes, last year? laughs> D- depending on which Ruby version you need to run. Yes, that's why I gave up on it because Ruby. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, oh, it's, Ruby, 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 Ruby. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so far having success with it. I run my personal blog oh. on it, and it's and it, and it works. And then some fine. gem will update or break, and then everything falls in a heap. Mm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Ruby, Ruby, and the ORM. That was my my madness because yeah. I worked on a project where they use the ORM extensively without understanding the underlying database schema at all. So they were happily going something dot collection dot collection dot collection yeah. in selects and that was uh many to many select joins on the database and then the question came yeah. back like but why is this breaking why is this slow you go like well look here you're doing this query that, which locks the whole database um yeah <laughs> so yeah so having too much sugar in your code sometimes is a bad thing yeah be careful with that so when mm. you deploy this is the things you need to monitor. You need to see how maybe your overcomplicated code that super fine works if you have five users, maybe it doesn't work with a thousand users mm. or ten thousand users. So that's one of the things you need to monitor when you're doing canary deployments. Hmm. C max. And, S- and you can use things. that to know. Like we had times where we'd have spikes, and it turns out we were featured on the App Store homepage yeah, or something, yeah. and no one knew about it until we saw that. Yeah, that's kind of. Oh thing. yeah. So, just answer a mm-hmm. question here from uh, from uh, Pradeep. I will get get to you in a second. Um, uh, Dan MBA, does Amplify do blue? Uh, do, do, does Amplify build uh, do canary or blue greens etc.? Not by default. So um, there is no direct way to do like a canary deployment or a blue green deployment with with um, with Amplify. But you can have feature branches. Um, you can have mm. basically a separate URL for a specific subset of, of, for example, a change, a branch in your in your repository. So if you make a change to your HTML code and want to have it in a in a in a separate branch, that's what what I do. I have a dev.mysite and then um, I have mm. all my testing there. It's actually even password protected, which is great. And then once mm. I'm happy with it, I just merge it to the main branch and it's fine. Mm. <clears throat> uh, so Pradeepa. Question might, might not be unrela- uh, might, might be unrelated. Ha- have you used AWS Code Guru as part of a pipeline to find code smells mm. and security guidelines? So I've not used it. It's a relatively new service. It's it's a, it has been launched last year, the year before that, and reinvent. Um, but Code Guru, for anybody wondering, is a service that uses the power of machine learning to um, to basically review your code. To do it does code reviews. And it also does profiling. So it is a great yeah. tool to, if you're writing in Python or Java, because <clears> it currently supports only those two things. And what you do is you, you make a pull request with a specific code set, snippet. Code Guru looks at it and gives you recommendations saying, hey, maybe you have a recursive function here. Or um, there's a better way to do X, Y, and Z in Java like this than what you're doing. So it actually yeah. uses the experience we built from running Java um, to your code. Um, is that the one that tells you the most expensive lines? Yes, it tells well? you also. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, does yeah, profiling. Yeah. So what it does, it actually goes through a code as it runs. It keep, can keep on monitoring and tell you, hey, these are very expensive lines you run, and this is what's causing a lot of latency. Actually, Amazon.com used a tool built based on that. Um, that the lower I, I, there was a number, like uh, during Prime Day, like sixty-seven percent or something. There was a number about how how much more code was improved after using it. Because well, at scale, so, so it, it is it is it is really cool. So, hmm. um, so um, Pradeepa was doing a proof concept uh, and could find Sonar Cube is very good when compared to AWS Code Guru. Hmm. 
haven't used I, it. I'm not familiar I with it. No, yeah, I, I, mm, it's so a, far. I've used it once or twice in the okay. past. It's an open source project that uh, uh, allows you to do static code analysis and a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. um, and um, from what I remember, it also it worked well. Um, I haven't worked with either enough to be able to tell you yes, the one or the other. But um, I think at the end of the day, it's like look at the feature set, see if it works for you or not. Um, and yeah, pick what works the best for you. Exactly. And, you know, some, some people just need a code review thing to do stat static analysis, and that's perfectly fine. You know, um, uh, uh, compared to just static analysis, CodeGuru also has the profiling option. So, um, you know, that's a, that's an additional mm -hmm. thing. But CodeGuru can be expensive, so uh, be careful with that. <laughs> uh, always always choose the right tool for the job, um, even if it has all the bells and mm -hmm. whistles. You may not need it. So, yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, um, this slowly brings us to the end. We're five minutes out of, um, of the hour. Um, so mm. What a Chris, fun chat. Yeah, Chris, it's been, it's been a pleasure <laughs> having you here. Uh, and we even managed to entertain you enough to stop knitting. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I did. I did put the knitting down. I was too intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> Chris actually does her streams. There's a Chris has her Twitch channel, the Knitting with Chris. So if you're interested in knitting, um, I actually joined you on Saturday or something. Did you really? And, yeah, I joined and I was like, there was nice music. So I, yeah. I just put you in the background listening to music and watch you knit while I do something else. Yeah. So not creepy at all. No. Um, <laughs> I bet number, a number of our colleagues have jumped on there. Yeah, Most exactly. of the times they say hello rather than just sit there stalking. But that's fine. I was the stalker from the corner. Yeah. Mm. Doc, uh, I but, think we need to contact your manager and uh, you know have, the, yeah, have a yeah, chat. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, that that does it for deployment strategies. So we we actually had a mm. fun time chatting about the deployment strategies, how not to deploy. We saw some problems. We learned about new things, such as well, actually, actually, I learned about new things such as the uh, release cops um, and slash dot. What? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's but you I'm, like old I'm, stuff. Know, you collect know, I, all I, that old stuff. I'm playing the meme. I'm playing the meme okay, of me okay. being much younger here. I know what okay. Flashdot is, and I, okay. I've used it twice. Maybe. Oh, my God. <laughs> Next up, he's going to tell us his password is Hunter 2. <laughs> it's not Hunter 2. It's just oh Asterix. My God. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to send you this really great meme. All your okay. base are belong to us. It's going to blow your mind. Yeah. I know, and the dancing baby gif and all that stuff. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, remember uh, I got my first PC in 2001, and it was a Windows 95 PC. So uh, I, I, the first time I've ever seen the internet was in 2004. So oh, <laughs> I okay. am very late to the game. So, <laughs> um, mm. but yeah, um, that being said, so next week um, we're going to continue in the same spirit, and uh, we're going to move on from talking about deployments and deployment strategies and testing to observability. To actually, are you looking at the right things when you actually mm. deploy your code? Because the deployment doesn't end during deployment. Once you deploy your code to production, you still need to keep an eye on it to see, is it doing what it's doing? So we're going to talk about mm. what are the things you should be looking at. We're going to talk about metrics. We're going to talk about percentiles. We're going to talk about averages, business outcomes, and what tools, what things can you use to kind of help that. And um, Werner had a whole bunch about that in his yep. reInvent keynote. Yep. Yeah, mm. because observability is not just your monitoring system. Nope. Observability is not just your dashboard. Observability is a lot more. It's a, it's a term that's relatively, I would say it's new because Word, Word just always tries to correct me about observability, telling me oh, that's yeah. not a word. You don't just write uh, O one one Y or yeah. you know. <laughs> so so yeah, um, it is it is something that that's that's relatively new, but we know, need to understand what it is. So next week at the same place, same time, we is it the same time? I don't know. Daylight saving is coming. So wait, yeah. the, I fixed this. I <laughs> I scheduled it. This week and last week was at the wrong time because okay. Darko and we based this show on Central Eastern time, which Central is supposed to be Central European time. Central European. Yeah, okay, see what I mean? I'm, I don't have, I only have South African time, which is like yeah. lucky vague. you. Lucky you. Um, so from next week, I believe it'll be one hour later. later. Check the Twitch schedule. Tw yes. The Twitch schedule yeah. and the twitch.com slash AWS, you will find the exact schedule. Just let the computer work it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't let us try to dates. No, no, uh, no, no, no. no. Dates Chris, are hard. Time zones work. are hard. <laughs> Especially when if a person in a different time zone, we had this with a Twitch schedule one. Chris, you'll love this. This is from Australia. Someone in Australia scheduled one of the Twitch streams on the which server which is sitting in the US. So they took when they are changing time zones into account, even the oh. thing that was scheduled in the US time zone, which resulted in things like moving, which is like, ow, no. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, we have not. It's the middle of the day in Germany. Yeah, Come on. Yeah. Declan, this is just this is just a, such an amazing. This is so just somebody, us. Co- somebody, somebody uh, commented in the chat saying, "Has everybody been drinking?" No, 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 no. This is just us hmm. in our natural habitat while we talk about technology and scream at each other. So um, it's so nice to talk to people after being locked up in my house too. So there might be a little bit of that going on. <laughs> But um, uh, just before you go, I just have one pro tip that I'd have to share after I did it today, which is this. Uh, what you can see over here, it's not my lovely brick wall. It's actually it's a green my green screen, screen thrown oh, over a bunch of crap. I thought you magically pull it off. Kobus, but next time, please, no. instead of the it's bricks, good. put the Super Mario bricks or something. Okay. It looks Where like a Super that? Mario bag. folders, like an invisibility cape. Yeah. <laughs> just have a floating head of Kobus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See? Oh my god! Wow, gosh. there you go. I need my, I need to get myself a green screen. So Kobus, yeah, next time it's gonna be just floating uh, heads. Just just like floating heads uh, talking. <laughs> well now you can see some of the crap there in the background, yeah. yeah. That's fine. That's that's what the green green screen says for. So thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Make sure to tune in next week. Um like, subscribe, smash like button, buy the merch. I don't know. Some kids to say does it go to slash dot. Um and and You need Dev and, Bears merch. Dev clearly. Bears by, by Dev Bears. Dev, yeah. Dev Beard Ops. And important about Dev Beard Ops, it's not the beard on the outside, it's the beard on the inside that counts. Mm. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh thank you very much. And uh we will be seeing you next week. Have a great week, Bye-bye. everybody. Cool.